Thanks for being here. Um, so, uh, just a couple of sort of short remarks, and then I'll give you a little introduction that's supposed to make everyone happy and give a background to everyone. Uh, first of all, I've organized this thing to have um, lots of breaks in between papers and lots of free time uh, so that, you know, actual conversation can go on. It's supposed to be a long three day conversation. I, you know, I personally strongly dislike conferences that you have to sit through six papers with a tiny, tiny break in between them because I stopped listening after the third. Um, so, you know, do the best, uh, use, use the time as, as productively as possible to you know, chat to other people. And there's lots of Q&A time, and then there'll be the round table at the end. So, you know, lots of freewheeling talking. Oh, that's also one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm recording. A second one, which is uh, important as well, I want to sort of apologize to everyone uh, for the lack of women speakers here. I, I, I promise you I tried my best to have at least a couple. I invited seven different female philosophers and all of them turned me down. Not, not because I'm unlike... <laughs> not, not because I'm unlikable, because they don't know me but because they had other conferences, they were traveling, they were at, the mo at this moment they're working on something else and they didn't feel comfortable with the specific theme of the conference. I mean, it was already pretty hard to find speakers that are you know, willing to engage with this sort of intersection of three different circles. So, um, you know, I tried and I failed. I just want to acknowledge this. And at least uh, we'll have four respondents on the last day and at least I manage a 50-50 balance there. Um, so, okay, for, as for short introduction, that's it. And uh, so this right now will be the only occasion in which you're going to have two papers, to listen to two papers without a break in between, or we're very sh we'll have a short break in between. All the other papers will, will have like a coffee break after or, or something else. So... <clears throat> This introduction will serve the function of framing the debates in the next three days. I will offer a potted history of the reception of Kant in both the analytic and the continental tradition, to which Sellers and Mayesu belong, and explain how and, how, how and why they are relevant to these traditions and relevant to each other. Uh, you know, some people might be puzzled as why they are relevant to each other. We'll, we'll figure it out somehow now. <clears throat> as you can imagine, doing this in about 40, 45 minutes, it means that my histories will be highly impressionistic. They, they won't go in any specific depth, but I, I hope they'll give a sort of good, rough image of what's going on. Um, I'm going to foreground relevant elements and ignore many others. Uh, keep this in mind, and you know, I apologize about this, but you know, the, the depth phase will be in the next three days. Now, this is just useful as an introduction. I hope I won't say anything downright false, but uh, at worst it will be incomplete. So by framing introduction, I mean I'm not going to go into the details of Sellers, Mayasu, or Kant, because that's what the speakers will do. So since I expect you to be a sort of varied audience with coming from different backgrounds, I, I, want, I think it's helpful to give you some basic coordinates so that everyone can find their bearings. So we begin with <clears throat> analytic philosophy, continental philosophy, and Kant. It is hardly original to claim that the split between continental and analytic philosophy can be explained, among many other ways, as deriving from two different approaches or responses to Kant. Uh, I'll give you just a few examples. Um, Michael, Friedman argued, oops, Michael Friedman argued that the new Kantian attempts to resolve the Kantian dichotomy between concepts and intuitions led to two con contrasting stances divided over the centrality assigned to logic, stances epitomized by the Marburg and the Southwest New Kantian schools, putting Heidegger in the line of descent of the latter and Carnap of, of the former. Richard Rorty, in his 19th century idealism and 10th, 20th century textualism, construed continental philosophy, in which in this case it 
construes as textualism, as descendants of the more romantic side of Kant, originating in the third critique and expanded by the German idealists. While taking analytic philosophy as carrying forward the Enlightenment inspired epistemological program of the first critique. In an interestingly uh, reverse take, uh, Lee Braver in this book has uh, more recently speculated that <clears throat> my claim is that continental thought follows the spirit of, his, of Kant's epistemology, while analytic thought follows the practical, which is rather ironic given analytic philosophy's emphasis on epistemology and continental insistence on the ubiquity of the ethical. Continental thought embodies the spirit of Kant's theoretical work, where essentially finite beings conditioned by forces beyond our control. And the job of philosophy is to help us understand these, not overcome them. There is nothing beyond them. Analytic philosophy takes up the ethical ethos. Although we may be conditioned by accidental features, philosophy uses reason to pierce through these conditions so that we can find truth which escapes their influence. In, as a last e example of this um, different reception of Kant, um, in this other book, Andrew Cutrofello <coughs> has aligned the divergence between analytic uh, thinkers with different interpretations, um, not just answers to the four uh, Kantian questions, what can I know, what ought I do, what may I hope, what is man? With particular regard to the last of these four, Cutrofello argued that Kant's enigmatic four question presupposes the dichotomy between the empirical and transcendental dimensions of human experience. My contention here is that continental philosophers have rejected this dichotomy in favor of a conception of human existence as empirically transcendental, and analytic philosophers have instead opted for a conception of human existence as transcendentally empirical. By the former, I mean the view that there is an important sense in which the natural world depends upon us, by the latter, the view that there is no feature of human existence that cannot be reduced to a manifestation of a nature that will continue to exist whether we were in it or not. There's um, some truth in all of these approaches, but in order to, gaze our, uh, our, to narrow our gaze to the particular contrast we're going to deal with here and to question to what extent Sellers and Mayer Sue are typical exponents of the tradition to which they belong, I will offer another sketch of, again, a very rough sketch of the of different receptions of Kant. So we'll start with um, Mayasu's background, Kant and 20th century continental philosophy. <coughs> I need to sort of give you a footnote here. Uh, that's why the asterisk. What I really mean here is post World War II French, mostly post World War II French philosophy, and that this. This is important because the immediate intellectual background of Mayasu lies mostly in the last four to five decades of French philosophy. But if we're talking about Kant, uh, a complete history of Kant in France would need to consider the new Kantianism that dominated the intellectual scene from roughly the 1890s to the 1940s in France. The, the new Kantianism balanced between spiritualism and Comte and positivism running from uh, at least, and these are like the the most important people one ought to mention, at least from Lachelier uh, to, all the way to Bachelard and peaking with the, the towering figure of Brunswick that during his time is like the absolute authority in, in, in France. This tradition goes underground and in fact is actively rejected by younger generation uh, for both philosophical and political reasons. Um, Roughly after the so-called return of Hegel, the explosion of existentialism, and the foreign import of phenomenology. <coughs> so the period of the, the, the three H's, so to speak, um, Hegel, Husserl, and Heidegger. Yet will later resurface with, uh, arguably with structuralism, and today with the Kant-inspired philosophy of science of philosophers like uh, Jean Petitot or Michel Bitbol. This Kantian reception, the Kantian reception I have in mind here, however, will be mostly the post Heidegger French reception of Kant. So, post uh, World War II continental philosophy is more willing than its neo Kantian predecessors to receive Kant through the important mediation of German idealism and takes the Kantian critique of metaphysics as both unsurpassable, that is, having placed the theme of finitude firmly on the philosophical agenda and as making possible an overcoming of its very limits. So in a move going from finitude to infinity. <clears throat> 
In a Galen fashion, it will often do so by giving an ontological spin to the Kantian no notion of conditions of possibility, so to speak, taking them out of the subject and injecting them into the imminent continuum of nature, and in a parallel move by temporalizing and historicizing them. Thinkers in this tradition tend mostly to focus on Kantian forms of intuition, particularly on the temporal structuring of the Kantian synthesis of representations, and on Kantian ideas as indemonstrable but necessary notion beyond, notions of beyond empirical determination. When Kantian concepts are approached, it is with an associated lack of emphasis on the logical structure of judgment involved in perception, and with an emphasis on difference as more fundamental than the determination of identity. As well, with an, uh, as, an, with, as, as well as with an insistence on the non-logical and non-empirical nature. So in continental philosophy, there is this, this nominalized form, the transcendental, which is hardly ever, you can hardly ever find in, in, in the analytic literature, which roughly comes to indicate this constellation of conditions of possibility that have a problematic placement on, on the metaphysical spectrum. In continental philosophy, the, in the relevant continental philosophy, the reception of Kant generally takes the shape of a heterodox and creative reinterpretation, where often the radicalization of Kantian tenets becomes almost indistinguish indistinguishable from their rejection, which becomes the condition of possibility for new forms of thinking, and for some, opening the door to post-critical metaphysical speculations. So in a move going from critique to creativity, or from the problem of constitution to the problem of genesis. Indeed, the theme of the future advent and of the new, so new thinking, new concepts, new subjects, is a crucial element of late 20th century continental philosophy, which often, when filtered to the powerful influence of Marx, um, is also conjugated into political terms. So for example, I think that this idea of a struggle to think novelty between philosophy and politics is well summarized in uh, the title of uh, this recent Gary Gutin book, Thinking the Impossible, which in, f in fact, I mean, it's French philosophy after the 60s. But you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good formula for this set of preoccupations. Often this excavation of or meditation upon the conceptual resources of philosophy itself led to the identification of something underlying empirical reality which could not be reinscribed by concepts, something that transgresses, that breaks the boundaries of the philosophically sayable, both conceptually and temporally. And from, for this, this second theme of, of temporality, uh, the, the, this entire book by John McCumber is organized around the idea that the central concern of continental philosophy is the issue of temporality. <coughs> This something, whatever it is, cannot be identified with any empirical reality, and it, and it is also heterogeneous with scientifically describable entities. So, just a few examples. Think about um, Heidegger's rejection of metaphysics, a metaphysics prisoner of categories that conceals or forgets being, of how his research for conditions of intelligibility leads to a primordial, unmediated encounter with being, the equation of ontology with phenomenology, and generally is openly anti-neo-Kantian ontolo ontological reading of Kant in Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics, which is a book that includes the infamous line, the critique of pure reason has nothing to do with epistemology, <coughs> uh, with a theory of knowledge, I think. Or think about Levinas's ethics as first philosophy presenting the anthematizable meta-ontological encounter with a radically transcendent and infinite other, openly breaking with Kantian finitude. Or think about Deleuze's transcendental empiricism, expropriating the subject of his synthesizing role and his reworking of Kantian problematic ideas in difference and repetition. Or consider Foucault's complex engagement with Kant on the theme of subjectivity and on the legacy of the Enlightenment, as well as his historical relativization of transcendental structures as epistemes or regimes of truth. Again, think about Derrida's repeated use, much to Rorty's dismay, of the term quasi-transcendental attached to his preconceptual operatic notions, the Ferrans, the Trace, the Paragon, the Pharmacon, making language and metaphysics at once possible and impossible. Finally, in what is certainly the most proximal influence on Mayasu himself, um, consider this 
polemical tirade of Kant of uh, Badieu against Kant. Uh, before before I show the I read the passage, I am not trying to suggest that this passage summarizes the French feeling about Kant. Uh, Badieu is often in you know open polemic with many of his contemporaries, but still there's something you know specifically French of this kind of reaction of Kant. And this is something that could not have been written you know, in another philosophical tradition, um, I believe. So, and it's fun. Kant is one author for whom I cannot feel any kinship. Everything in him exasperates me. A ball of is legalism. Always asking, quid juris, or haven't you crossed the limit? Combined, as in today's United States, with a religiosity that is all the more dismal, and that it is more both omnipresent and vague. The critical machinery has set up has enduringly poisoned philosophy while giving great succor to the academy, which loves nothing more than to wrap the knuckles of the overambitious, something for which the injunction you do not have the right is a constant boon. Kant is the inventor of the disastrous theme of our finitude, the solemn and sanctimonious declaration that we can have no knowledge of this or that always foreshadows some obscure devotion to the master of the unknowable, the god of the religions or his placeholder placeholders, meaning, being, meaning, life, to render impracticable all of Plato's shining promises, which was that this is the task of the obsessive Konigsberg, our first professor. Nevertheless, once he breaches one particular question, you are unfailingly obliged, if this question preoccupies you, to pass through him. His relentlessness, that of a spider of the categories, is so great. Is the limitation of notion so consistent? Is conviction, albeit mediocre, so violent that whether you like it or not, you will have to run his gauntlet? Kant is a paradoxical philosopher whose intentions repel, whose style disheartens, whose institutional and ideological effects are appalling, but from whom there simultaneously emanates a kind of sepulchral greatness, <laughs> like that of a great watchman whose case you cannot escape and who you can't help learning, uh, fearing will entrap you into demonstrating your speculative guilt, your metaphysical madness. You know, you can disagree with this, but it's, a it's just a great passage. <clears throat> um, okay, so how much of this varied Kantian reception does Mayasu inherit, and how much does he break with it? What he certainly rejects is what he calls the real without realism that is common to many 20th century continental philosophers, which is a real that can be talked about as the impossibility of any conceptualization, itself withdrawn from conceptual articulation. This, in, in, in other words, uh, is pretty much exactly what Lee Braver has called transgressive realism, which he described as the only kind of realism available to continental philosophers working within a Kantian anti-realist paradigm uh, filtered through Hegel. So Lee Braver describes this transgressive realism in this way. This is not from that book of before, it's another, uh, it's another paper. Transgressive realism, I'm arguing, offers a via media, a way to have our cake, our ineffable cake and F it too. It gives us a reality that transcends our ways of thinking, but not all access to it. These operatic experiences enter our awareness not through pathways prepared by our active minds, but in spite of them, short-circuiting our anticipatory thought processes and violating the recollective model of learning that has haunted philosophy since Mina's slave learned a little math. Sometimes these strange ideas transform our very way of thinking, reshaping our categories around their non-Euclidean shapes, but the best permanently escape any attempts to classify them. These are the wild thoughts that continue to buckle domestication, escaping stable categories. These are the ideas prized by so many continental thinkers, which help explain what may look like a willful obfus obfuscation and thumbing their nose at basic rational principles. So th this kind of approach uh, certainly Mayasu rejects. <clears throat> Yet one can take Mayasu's rejection of any limitation for reason, his will to go after finitude, as the title of his book, so beyond Kantian critique, as both breaking and not breaking with this tradition, depending on, on how one in, wants to interpret it. He intends his move to be strongly critical of most of post-war French philosophy, uh, yet arguably with a particular emphasis on the so-called theological turn of, of French phenomenology. And this ambiguity, this sort of depth and non-depth regarding the continental uh, reception of Kant is also evident in his insistence that he wants to reach his realist conclusion by going through the Kantian argument. 
in a classic move of radicalization which becomes rejection. What is truly a clean break with much of the continental tradition that precedes, that precedes him is his insistence in directly grasping a reality, a scientifically describable and therefore, therefore conceptually available reality, not the real qua knowable, but the real as exhaustively knowable. However, here too, his, his hyper-rationalist stance is clearly not totally unprecedented, since he does preserve some of the anti-empiricist spirit of French philosophy, and his materialism is not a straightforward one, as we will see in a moment. So this sort of concludes the Meiesu background part, and now I, I try to give you an answer of why is Meiesu significant. So as I, as I already suggested, he proposes a revival of materialism and rationalism, both in a very French form. It can be best seen, uh, at least I think, in the line of descent of the French Russia, uh, rationalist epistemology first through the important influence of Badiou immediately before him, and then back through time, through Althusser, Canguilhem, Bachelard, and Cavillers. These are the philosophers of the concept, opposing the philosophers of the subject or of consciousness, who take both an anti-empiricist and, and an anti-vitalist stance towards the philosophy of science, and have a very rarefied conception of matter, a formalist materialism. So one can think of Meyesu as inheriting a, a kind of mixture of Bachelard's insistence on a rationalist interpretation of mathematized physics and Althusser's, late Althusser's uh, aleatory materialism. Of course, both filtered to the important influence of Badiou. Meyassu's own is a philosophy that denies an intrinsically rational, self-synthesizing, self-organizing structure of reality in favor of chaos, and yet, the means of accessing such reality remain purely rational. This is accompanied by his neo-Cartesian rehabilitation of the talk of, of both primary qualities and intellectual intuition, which sometimes he, he wants to call dianoetic intuition. His insistence on, on mathematical formalization and his shifting of anti-foundationalism from epistemology to ontology. This French epistemological tradition was very under-examined in the Anglophone world until recently. And, you know, probably one of the reasons why it got more interesting is sort of the explosion of Badieu. Um, and on, on, on this theme, I just want to quickly recommend, because I really like it, um, uh, Knox Payton's recent excellent book on the history of the clash of Spinozistic rationalism and phenomenology in, in French philosophy. So this tradition was under-examined, so much so that for much of the 20th century, when an Anglophone philosopher heard continental philosophy, what he thought essentially was phenomenology. So with, with this background in place, in 2006, when After Finitude comes out in, in France, to rationally refute the correlationist, which is um, is very influential term that defines the post-Kantian philosopher that postulates the impossibility of grasping the object outside of its correlation with the thinking subject, in order to offer a logical demonstration of a realism consonant with the natural sciences was something of a revolutionary move from both the point of view of method and content, especially considering the dominant interpretation of continental philosophy in Anglophone countries. And, and you know, this explains the much greater popularity, at least the first, but I, I figure still today, of Meyassou outside France than inside. I, there's, there's an interview with him from a few years ago where he, where he says clearly that you know, in France I hardly got my book reviewed a couple of times and, and abroad everyone is reading me and this is quite funny and puzzling to me. This is the reason why, because you know, in Anglophone countries there's always been a sort of partial understanding of French philosophy that, well, never mind, it's just my supposition. <clears throat> Sorry, I've lost my place. Okay, yet at the same time, as I, as I just said before, I think it was profoundly coherent with both the tradition of French rationalism from Descartes onwards and with the history of, of the reception of Kant in France and its long-standing problematic of the overcoming of the transcendental. So, for example, just a few years ago, Catherine Malabu published this paper on Can We Relinquish the Transcendental, which is a paper on Mayasu, and 
it focuses on the difference between abandoning and relinquishing the transcendental, and it's it's sort of a critique of Mayasu, but at the same time places him, you know, squarely within a very defined tradition of French philosophy and takes him as being, you know, less than a break than other people want to construe it, construe him as. Okay, this <coughs> closes our first um, sort of half, but well, third really. And we're moving to Sellers as background, Canton and 20th century analytic philosophy. A proper discussion of the powerful influence of Kant on, on 20th century analytic philosophy would need to consider a very complex sociological and geographical distribution of influences, particularly as just as it was in the case of, of French philosophy, even though in France there's a, a more clean break in, in the mostly German tradition, there's less of a clean break through the evolution and the powerful influence and then the slow demise of Neo-Kantianism in Germany. Uh, I've stolen this, uh, this diagram from one of Brandom's lecture that just you know, shows the evolution of a few important names of Neo-Kantianism in Germany after 1860, uh, you know, then bottoming down in the uh, famous debates between Heidegger and, and Carnap and Kassir. <coughs> but you know, this, this background is important. What I will mostly focus on are those elements that are relevant for us here and are concerned with sellers, which also means thinkers before and not after sellers. I'm not going to talk about Kantian inspired after sellers. In very general lines, the Kantian distinction between the sensible and intellectual faculties was rejected. The post Frigian interest in logic and language made the interpretation and correction of Kant's orthogonal distinction between a priori and a posterior justification and analytic and synthetic knowledge, the focus of attention of most philosophers in this, in this tradition. And the almost complete avoidance of the German idealist reception of Kant, mostly because it was influenced by, by this tradition here that is in active rejection of many German idealists, um, made the analytic tradition less interested in transcendental idealism. And you know, this is a, a rejection that represents an anti-Kantian stream running the very least from Moore all the way to Strawson, as well as in questions of genesis and in historicist revisions for fear of incurring into psychologism or the genetic fallacy. Epistemology is, is concerned with the validity of the logical form of judgment, a concept that is independent from any contingent origin in the empirical subject. In Britain and America, Kant was at least the first often uncritically bunched together with other German idealists. And the anti-idealist push towards realism that takes place in both countries in the first decades of the 20th century tends to produce a less than flattering opinion of Kant's contribution to philosophy. So for example, um, G. E. Moore in 1903 writes two papers, at least two papers, uh, The Refutation of Idealism and Kant's Idealism. And in, in the second, he considers Kant's transcendental idealism as in the end not that different from that of Berkeley's. A bit better, but not that different. While Kant's insistence on a theory of knowledge and his concern about the possibility of mathematical knowledge is well received, so by Russell, for example, many details of his theory were rejected or reinterpreted under an empiricist, somewhat human light. His stance towards synthetic a priori principles, often considered too weak or contingent upon the psychology of minds to be a priori, his link of mathematics with the forms of intuition, which went against the logicist project of the Principia, Russell's Principia, and his transcendental idealist understanding of appearances, his empirical realism seen as not realist enough first, think of more in Russell's early um, conceptual Platonism, and his noumen or realm as suspiciously metaphysical later, essentially with Wittgenstein, these are all objects of critique. In Austria and Germany, the reception of Kant can be, again, roughly usefully summarized in what Alberto Coffa called the semantic tradition, comprised by those philosophers rejecting any Kantian notion of pure intuition, and who seek an alternative account of a priori knowledge than Kant's exposing Kantian confusions in the wake of recent logical breakthroughs, and for whom the key philosophical progress lay in clarity brought about by the semantic analysis of the nature and role of concepts and propositions. A tradition by and large, which moves the dialectic between realism and idealism in the background and focuses on the problem of meaning. 
So in Kantian spirit, but not in its letter, the proper domain of metaphysics, you know, when it's put on the secure path of science, moves from ontological speculation about the world to the analysis of natural, mostly in Britain, and formal, mostly in, in Austria, languages, taking the shape of a linguistic Kantianism, as one could detect, for example, in the Tractarian Wittgenstein, and later evolving into uh, Strozen's rendition of Kant's stance as a descriptive metaphysics of our conceptual scheme, or Carnap's idea of linguistic frameworks. The difference from the continental reception of Kant is here well exemplified <clears throat> by the profoundly different sense given by Carnap and Heidegger to the idea of overcoming metaphysics. So while Heidegger's overcoming, which is not overcoming, it's more destruction, but signifies a return to fundamental ontology freed from metaphysical constraints, Carnap's elimination of it through the logical analysis of language represents the ontologically deflationary replacement of metaphysics by semantics as first philosophy. This clash, of course, had an important precedent in the famous Davos debate in 1929 with um, uh, Heidegger and, and Kassir uh, and Carnap in, in the audience. And then a significant evolution in Heidegger's inspired critiques or deconstructions of metaphysics in France, including, I think, his intention of withstanding Maya Sue's own rejection of the metaphysical in favor of the speculative. So, an explicitly anti-speculative, which is anti-Hegelian, neo-Kantian tradition running from the back to Kant movement of the 1870s, inspired by philosophers, scientists like Marc Helmholtz and Poincaré, particularly the Marburg School of Cassier, Nathorpe, and Cohen, all the way to Viennese logical positivism, construed philosophy as a second order discipline, a meta theory of science, providing a service of clarification of scientific concepts, in itself a Kantian position, yet abandoning the systematic ambition the philosophy enjoyed in Kant's construal, its transcendental idealism, and modifying its notion of apriority. This is an anti-metaphysical neo-Kantianism concerned with the Kantian quid juris question, and by and large, shaping the Kantian approach as an epistemology of science, an Urkentist theory. Concerned with a linguistic redefinition of the notion of analyticity, and inspired by contemporary science, above all the discovery of non-Euclidean geometries and their uh, physical application in, in Einstein's theories, the branch of logical positivism, which is epitomized by Schlick, Carnap, and Reichenbach, will pursue a new Kantian project of definition of relativized a priori principles, one with important similarities with the new Kantian project of conceptual pragmatism of C. L. Lewis in the US, which is a direct influence on sellers. Yet, this project will not survive for long, and this logical positivist inheritance will eventually turn to a decidedly non-Kantian direction and again, this is, I, I'm simplifying, with the emergence of Quinean radical empiricism, its naturalist abandonment of first philosophy, and the rejection of the analy analytic synthetic distinction. Marking the end of the linguistic semantic phase of analytic philosophy, which was still flirting with Kantian themes, and giving it the naturalistic, scientific, and anti-transcendental orientation still, by and large, predominant today. So, with, with this background in place, how and why is Sellers significant? Sellers is a unique specimen in 20th century philosophy because he represents a profoundly sui generis synthesis of philosophical inheritances and influences. Number one, number one, Sellers belongs to the first generation of American philosophers who were genuine analytic philosophers. That is, that they were influenced by, and in certain cases studied with, the German and Austrian emigres in the States. The new logical project of linguistic analysis of Carnap and Wittgenstein, particularly the methods of semantic ascent to a meta-language, the idea of picturing, and the explication rather than analysis of conceptual meaning as use, are crucial influences for the young Sellers. Yet he will also be one of the first philosophers proposing an anti-anti-metaphysical stance, calling for a rejection of the phenomenalism seemingly implied by the logical positivist ontologically agnostic stance and defending a robust physicalist scientific realism. Number two, 
Sellers inherits from his father, Roigut Sellers, a deep familiarity with the epistemological debates between idealism and realism in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s in the States. He inherits his father's systematicity, his critical form of, epi of epistemological realism, his concern with squaring a post-Darwinian naturalistic understanding of mind and a physicalist ontology with our common sense experience of ourselves and the world. So, to give a easy contrast class, unlike Quine, or at least most interpretations of Quine, defending a non-reductive naturalism. And finally, he also inherits his father's secular humanism, which is somewhat more obscure, but it's still latent in the background. Number three, Sellers was also well acquainted with and sympathetic towards, in, in this case unlike his father, with pragmatism by means mostly of C.A. Lewis, especially regarding conceptual pragmatism, Pierce, especially regarding the regulative ideal of a complete scientific conceptual framework, and Dewey, especially regarding the pertinence of Darwinian evolutionism for philosophy, something that takes particular form in his interest in the interdependence of language and behavior, which will lead to his approach to rules as articulated by material inference principles and not just logical formal ones. Number four, Sellers was also pretty much because, I think, because of contingencies in his philosophical training and his, in his biography, unusually well disposed towards the history of philosophy, at least as compared to most of his peers in that time. Uh, you know, not to bash Quine too much, but there's the, the famous phrase, uh, there are two kinds of philosophers, those interested in philosophy and those interested in the history of philosophy is usually attributed to Quine. <clears throat> so, you know, well, Sellers indeed wrote on a variety of historical figures like Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, Leibniz, Berkeley, Descartes, and especially Kant. The Kantian influence was particularly unorthodox in a period, say roughly the 1960s, where Kant was considered by many an historically interesting but philosophically outdated figure. You know, of course, then there's the Strozonian revival, the Rhodes revival, but it's roughly either in that decade or the decade after. Um, and hence the famous ambition attributed to Sellers by Rorty to move analytic philosophy from its human to its Kantian phase. So his critique of empiricism and naturalization of Kantian transcendentalism, marrying transcendental idealism and scientific realism, his project of transcendental linguistics, his framework relative conception of synthetic priori principles, his nominalist metalinguistic account of modality, all these represent unique reactualization of Kantian potentials made possible by, but at times critical of, 20th century philosophical developments. From logical positivism to pragmatism through his father's critical realism. Number five, finally, even though this influence is, you know, much harder to detect and maybe isn't there, but you know, one, one can speculate, Sellers did spend a total of four years in Paris, when he was about 10 years old and when he was about 20 years old. And in the second of these periods, he attended at least one year, I think just one, one scholastic year, at the, um, at the Lycée Louis de Grand, which is possibly the most famous high school institution in Paris, which educated many big names in French philosophy. So, you know, just to give a few names, Sartre, Derrida, Lyotard, Merleau-Ponty, and Mayassou went to the Louis de Grand. In his autobiographical reflections, Sellers is very clear that his first encounter with philosophy, in fact, happened in Paris. So he says, at the Lycée, I was enrolled in the Classe de Mathématiques and began a program with a strong scientific orientation. Nevertheless, it was here that I had my first encounter with philosophy. I say my first encounter in all seriousness, for I scarcely knew that there was a subject called philosophy, let alone that there was such a subject. My first serious reading of philosophy then, such as it was, was in Marx, Engels, Lenin, and in general the philosophical and quasi-philosophical polemical literature, which is the lifeblood of French intellectuals. And then a bit later, nevertheless, my first academic contact with philosophy was, as I indicated above, in a course at the LIC. Even as surveys go, it was thin stuff, but it did give me a sense of how philosophical issues were classified and an acquaintance with some of the ma major philosophers in French perspective. So, I mean, depending how, how strongly you want to take this last sentence, that, you know, it gave him 
a sense of how philosophical issues were classified and which figures are important, you can decide how much this was actually a, um, an influence. You know, you might wonder, <clears throat> I have wondered, who would be this import major philosophers in French per perspective in 1929, 1930? Um, I have actually scanned uh, Sellers' <coughs> notebook in, in high school, which you see here. This, I believe, is Sellers roughly in his 20s. Um, and stuff that I managed to, to figure out, because the handwriting is kind of impossible, is um, I've definitely seen the names of uh, Descartes, Comte, and Bergson, which isn't a big surprise. Uh, there are notes on the empiricism-rationalism distinction, notes on Berkeley and the scientific, uh, sorry, Bacon and the scientific method, basic philosophy of science and mathematics, ethics, and quite a bit on sociology. Surely, as we've seen since in, it's Paris in 1930, he must have heard and possibly read Brunswick, that at the time was like the peak philosophical figure in France. And um, this is the actual f very first two um, paragraphs in the notebook. And it's interesting to see that he you know, started with a definition of formal logic. And I think even, even more that he was given a, a very French definition of epistemology as, you know, as the logic of the sciences rather than the, the theory of knowledge. <clears throat> and a few pages later, this might be of interest to someone, but you know, someone should really translate this entire thing. It's, I mean, it's really for sellers nerds, but it's, it's, it's nice. Um, there are quite a few notes on this uh, Louis Couturat that was a French logician and he was the first translator of, of Russell's Principia in, in French. And he was quite big in, in his days. So these are, I, I mentioned the, the five reasons why Sellers is important and somewhat unorthodox. <clears throat> Having said this, those not well acquainted with analytic philosophy would probably surmise that Sellers was, and is still today, a central figure, which is not quite. Sellers, precisely because of his heterodox influences, as well as his rather forbidding style, was underestimated during his lifetime, and still today there's something vaguely tribal in, in the group of the Salarsians, which are and are not part of the analytic orthodoxy. Even after the very influential work of big post salarsian figures like Rorty, who in 1970 would say of Sellers that he was the most original and far-sighted systematic philosopher now writing in English. And you know, just consider how strong this claim is in 1970 when, you, when Quine is at his brightest, when Putnam is a rising star, when Kripke is just given naming a necessity, and you know, Rorty was very much on team sellers. <clears throat> and uh, Robert Brandom just last year insisted that Sellers is the greatest American philosopher of the middle years of the 20th century. This role of relative outsider is not just an historical or sociological curiosity, but I think it is also important now, and I will come back to this shortly, when looking at the reasons why Sellers became relevant to so-called speculative realism, and, and then at the end why we're all here talking about these people. <coughs> Which leads me to the question, what is this speculative realism? I'll, I'll try to it, it can be somewhat controversial. I'll just give you the, the facts, mostly. In, in April 2007, uh, four philosophers came together at a conference at Goldsmiths College in London. The idea behind the conference was to question and critique the correlationist, anti-representationalist, anthropocentric, and anti-realist consensus in continental philosophy from within continental philosophy itself merging the speculative ambition proper of this tradition with a robustly realist outlook. An idea that was catalyzed by the publication just the year before of Meyer-Sue's Après la Finitude. There was no precise agreement on any substantial philosophical thesis shared by all four philosophers. And what held them in together was mostly this critical approach against the status quo of continental philosophy. The transcript of the conference discussions was published in the third volume of the journal Collapse in late 2007 and was distributed widely. Ray Brassier's translation of Meyer-Sue's book was published in 2008, and another conference was held at the University of the West of England in uh, April 2009. 
with the same speakers as the first one, minus may assume that I think couldn't make it or was already not willing to leave Paris. We tried very hard to get him here, I should say this. We, I, we tried very hard, but it didn't work out. For a number of reasons, this idea of a speculative realism spread like wildfire among a significant minority of early career researchers and graduate students in continental philosophy. And very soon, the first pieces of secondary literature started being published. I believe that the very first things that sort of mention it um, are these, which is the first, journal, the first issue of the journal Speculation, uh, UCD's very own Paul Ennis's Continental Realism, and the collection, The Speculative Turn, all of which came about in 2000, early 2011. <coughs> uh, followed by a sudden proliferation of similar monographs, collections, and journals over the last six years or so. Uh, this is a roughly chronological order of stuff that has come out in the last, well, not even 10 years. And I've just put on the, the, the things that have either realist or speculative in the title. If I was more generous, there would be many more. <clears throat> As it often happens, this explosion produced some philosophically interesting and some less interesting results. Even considering this varied outcome, the fact that these new ideas got people so excited does speak of the dissatisfaction that many young philosophers nurtured towards the established orthodoxy of continental philosophy between the 1990s and the early 2000s. An environment perceived as being sterile, self-referential, and impotent from the philosophical, scientific, political, and aesthetic point of views. The main culprit here was a peculiar mixture of phenomenological subjectivism, post-Foucauldian systematic genealogical skepticism, roughly what came to be known as theory, and late Deridian, and late Deridian textualism. Even though one should keep in mind, and I, I care about this, that the actual culprits are the acolytes much more than the philosophers themselves. I'm not, I'm not bashing Foucault and Derrida, absolutely. A number of other continentally trained philosophers from Europe, notably France, Germany, and Italy, flocked to the, man, to the banner of this new realist turn, while others, still today, find it an unjustified, superficial, and simple-minded reaction. Sorry. So for example, uh, this paper got published, what, weeks ago in, in our very own IJPS and in, by a you know, very well-established phenomenologist defending phenomenology against, against a specific book but that used speculative realism uh, uh, as a means to undermine uh, the project of phenomenology. For our present purposes, any construal of speculative realism as a unitary entity falls apart after the acknowledgement of the profound sl split, among others, between those who utterly reject the Kantian epistemological methods and those who are interested in achieving a post-Kantian realism compatible with contemporary science. And here's a basic explanation, and I, I simplify, for the turn to sellers, for which the main responsible is Ray Brassier, whom in wherever he is, who in his, in his 2007 Neil Unbound, a book concerned with the trenchant critique of a certain orthodoxy of continental philosophy, introduced Sellers and his distinction between manifest and scientific images and recruited him as an ally in his struggle against the phenomenological primacy of subjective experience and anti-rationalism. And I think there's an, there's an interesting coincidence here, which is another sort of contingent or, or sociological explanation of this turn to sellers within the continental community, that this phenomenon of people starting being interested in sellers coincided quite almost exactly with you know, what I like to call the sellers renaissance. <coughs> These are all books on sellers that got published. The earliest one, Bill the Vries, is over there in 2005. These three in 2007, the same year that ne Ray's Neil and Bound comes out and then, what, 2009, 12, 15, and 16, and, and we'll launch this book here on Friday. So, you know, this, this sudden interest in, in a different environment has coincided with, you know, given that also Sellers is pretty tricky to get a grip on if you just read him, you know, with fresh eyes, this was also a, a massive help. Uh, these are, these are, this is the, of course, this is in French and this is in German. Uh, 
<coughs> introductions to others. The many speculative realist denunciations of the Kantian correlationist tradition as one inevitably leading to forms of anthropocentric Kantian realism, so what Mayasu calls the Kantian catastrophe, make a number of inexplicit interpretive assumptions about Kant. Of course, as a matter of historical fact, the history of the reception of Kant in the continental tradition, by and large, did indeed follow a path leading to positions hostile to scientific realism, objectivism, and naturalism. But other more critical forms of speculative realism claim this very specific Wirkunggeschichte should not obscure alternative, possible, and plausible readings of Kant. Since to utterly reject epistemological self-consciousness, conceptual, conceptual analysis, and normativity alongside post-Kantian correlationism would be philosophically irresponsible. Indeed, some form of speculative realism are ready to pay any price to grant objectivity to pretty much everything, guided by the ontologically democratic notion that nothing should be privileged over anything else. Others nurture a Kantian skepticism towards this liberal metaphysics, denying any difference between appearances and realities, and are keen to integrate this Kantian skepticism with a rationalism breaking with postmodern end of philosophy systematic suspicion, and with a properly 21st century respect towards the sciences. And once again, hence explain the turn to sellers, whose historical consciousness, neo-pragmatist tendencies, systematic method, and speculative ambition made uniquely able to provoke the interest of this post-continental audience. <clears throat> this should serve as a very summary explanation of why we're here today to compare two very different forms of post-Kantian realism. The one defined, defended by Mayasu predicated on a rejection of Kant, but the rejection that goes through, not the rejection that bypasses, and one offered by Sellers, marrying struc uh, Kantian structures with scientific realist contents. So for example, and I'm, I'm, I'm concluding, two, the two kinds, of realist stances, two kinds of realist stances can derive from the acknowledgement of the facticity or contingency of our cognitive structures. The kind defended by Mayasu, where the fact of their contingency is inflated into an ontological insight, a classic continental move, as, as I've argued, or the kind defended by Sellers, where their contingency is cashed out in Persian spirit in terms of their ability of evolving and adapting towards the accurate, accurate description of a non-chaotic reality. So even though offering very different solutions, Sellers and Mayasu, and I would add Kant under certain uh, interpretations, shared the goal of making realist sense of the possibility of modern science. For Mayasu, mathematical ideation secures its grasp on reality thanks to an elaborate link he traces between the contingency of formalism and the contingency of being. But the very possibility of math mathematical ideation is a rationalist postulate. In explicit Hegelian spirit, for Mayasu it is reason that grants through rational demonstration an intellectual intuition of the real. And you know, as I've always understood or interpreted Mayasu when all is said and done, the problem, or at least one of the very crucial problems that concerns him, is to make these two true claims consistent. Number one, reality is necessarily contingent, which he takes to have proven in his Aufhebung of correlationism in after finitude, and two, the mathematized sciences offer, offer a true description of reality, which a scientific realist needs to affirm. His problem is to put them together. For Sellers, a much more post-Darwinian thinker than Mayasu, who in, in this at least shares the anti-empiricist stance of Badieu, the possibility of any normative conceptual structure, including mathematics, even though Sellers has no fully formed philosophy of mathematics, has to have its conditions of possibility in the continuum of nature. But this does not boil down to a naive naturalized epistemology, but rather aims to show how normative conceptual structures are ontologically dependent, but logically irreducible to the causal system of nature. For an example, and just one, of how this shared interest in tracking the conceptual progress of the sciences takes an interestingly different form, consider these two passages. For Sellers, they're coming. For Sellers, the evolution of conceptual structures is ultimately converging towards an actual picturing of reality. And we can find him explaining in, in uh, Science and Metaphysics that the purely formal aspects of logical syntax, 
when they've been correctly disentangled, give us a way of speaking which abstract from those features which differentiate specific conceptual structures and enables us to form the concept of a domain of objects which are pictured in one way, less adequate, by one linguistic system, and in another way, more adequately, by another. And we can conceive of the former, of, or the less adequate, linguistic system as our current linguistic system. Ah. Guided by a similar interest in finding a way to achieve an increasingly correct representation of reality, Mayasu claims that my objective can therefore be stated as follows. To demonstrate that mathematics permits physics to produce revisable hypotheses pertaining to the contingent givens of a world independent of us as regards to its factual existence. Thus we have arrived at, the, at an understanding of the remarkable capacity of the sciences to describe the universe as it existed anterior to man and to living beings and as, I, and as it will without doubt exist after they have gone. What is mostly instructive in this contrast, I think, is how it exemplifies the influence of their two philosophical backgrounds. While Sellers shares his generation's central preoccupation with the logical, syntax, syn logical syntactic analysis of language, from Frege to Carnap through Wittgenstein, Mayasu stands inherit highlights how mathematics has always been privilege privileged over logic in French philosophy of science. Think again of Bachelard and Cavaillesse's rejection of logis logicism and their defense of the productive autonomy of mathematics. Also because, uh, I simplify, logicism was seen on the side of positivism, while mathematics was considered as rationally independent from the empirical. And for a more recent example of, of this trajectory, in, which has directly influenced Mayasu, think of, of Badiou's The Concept of Model. These are just some preliminary suggestions of the possible Kant-mediated discussions that can take place between the stances of Sellers and Mayasu. And in the next three days, or two days, we will listen to our speakers discuss many other problems pertaining to these thinkers. I might go on, but it's already been too long, so uh, I guess that's it. And um, thank you, and I hope I've given enough of a background for everyone.